The town of Orangetown is proud of its heritage. The town motto is Orangetown, rich in history. Numerous historic markers celebrating its key role in the American Revolution dot its tree-lined streets. Many of the buildings involved in our fight for independence over 200 years ago still exist today. However, Orangetown would play a major role in the largest global conflict man has ever known, and the only evidence remaining of its participation is this marker and small park in Orangeburg. On the night of September 25, 1942, property owners in Blauvelt and Tapan were summoned to the Greenbush Road School to hear an army officer tell them that under the War Powers Act, their land was to be confiscated to establish an army base. They were given two weeks to move out. With these 1,365 acres and another 675 leased from the state of New York, Camp Shanks was established. Named after Major General David Shanks and at a cost of over $45 million, 17,444 workers worked 24 hours a day through the coldest winter on record to build hundreds of buildings that at one time would hold over 75,000 troops. The speed at which this mammoth task was accomplished was nothing short of amazing. Uh, it, it was tremendous because first you have to realize how quickly it came to be. They broke ground in September of 42 and by January of 43, slightly three months later, they constructed 1,500 buildings almost out of nowhere. Uh, it became the largest embarkation point on the East Coast. Uh, the base was established as a processing area for troops bound for the war in Europe. Here, troops received their gear and orders before being shipped out. The base included not only barracks, but four theaters, a post office, chapels, an officer's club, a hospital, and a gym. But the main purpose of Shanks was to move troops out, and this they did. Some by train to ships in New York City or Hoboken, others were marched to what is now the Piermont Recreation Pier. A sanctuary for wildlife, a haven for crabbers, and even a temporary berth for ships like the Clearwater the peacefulness of this place now belies the fact that nearly 50 years ago it was a hub of activity as Camp Shanks shipped out over a million men to the bloody European conflict from this very pier. On its busiest day, Shanks moved out over 27,000 GIs in 19 hours. It also handled troops returning from the war and acted as a processing center for German and Italian prisoners of war. In addition to the GIs, Camp Shanks had a complement of 387 officers, over 5,000 enlisted men and women, 87 nurses, and over 1,500 civilian workers employed there. With the end of the war and the troops safely home, Camp Shanks found a new purpose as a low-cost housing development for veterans, and Camp Shanks became Shanks Village. Originally proposed as a national cemetery similar to the one in Arlington, Virginia, it took a Columbia University push to have it established as a housing area where veterans attending that university could find lodging. The rustic conditions, there was a single oil heater per apartment and no bathtubs, did not dissuade thousands of veterans from establishing new families while continuing their educations at Columbia and other area colleges. After being the largest port of embarkation on the East Coast, processing over 1.3 million men bound for the European war, and serving the peacetime needs of many of those veterans, Shanks closed its doors forever when it was sold to land developers in 1956. Gradually, all signs of Shanks began to disappear. The old barracks were torn down to make room for more modern, middle-class homes. Only the skeleton of the troop ship ferry slips remained. The train tracks used to carry tens of thousands of GIs now rust from lack of use. But due to the efforts of people like Jerry Dinellen, a Vietnam vet, the spirit of Shanks must be remembered. I think the idea of a need to come together when there is a common enemy, and again, I hope there's no common enemy in sense of war anymore, but there are things we do need to battle in terms of disease. If we could get that spirit, even for a short period of time, I think we would do a lot. Another veteran, Bob Little, a World War II fighter pilot who spent nearly a year in a Nazi prison camp and was actually returned through Camp Shanks, echoes the importance of remembering the sacrifice made by the men who passed through Camp Shanks. And I am really distraught at the fact that World War II and the exploits of the men who fought in World War II are completely forgotten. And seeing Shanks go the way it did after it served so many people, uh, and I commented to Jerry uh, Dinellen about the fact that the uh, North had written a book and completely neglected American prisoners of war. Uh, and they hadn't realized that any of us had come through here. And this again was because it happened 45 years ago. And I compliment Jerry and Scott Weber for the work they're doing 
in building this museum. A museum dedicated to the men and women of Camp Shanks is planned in this most appropriate building, a barrack-style structure on the site of the school where it all began 50 years ago. It is scheduled to open by next summer. Reporting for Ion Rockland, this is Frank Labuono. Dawn over the Hudson River. A special time in a special place. Especially this time in this place. It's Peterson's boatyard in Upper Nyack, and this will be the last vestiges of the sun we will see for a few days as it struggles for control of the sky with the angry clouds of Tropical Storm Danielle. The clouds are racing up from the southeast and will soon dominate the morning sky. However, even their dominating presence cannot diminish the beauty of this peaceful place. Hook Mountain, an ancient and rare geological wonder, frames the north, and the soon-to-be jam-packed Tappan Zee Bridge the south. Just how long Peterson's has served this old river, no one is exactly sure. In the early 1800s, New York wished to encourage shipbuilding, and it has probably existed as a marine facility for at least since then. Rumors say that it was not only a shipbuilding facility, but a rest stop for travelers with a grocery store and post office to serve them on their journey down the Hudson and to the New York Harbor and the sea. This is not firmly established. What is, is that Peterson's has served as a home for master shipbuilders at least since World War I, when wooden subchasers were built for the war effort. This tradition continued into World War II, when many of these crafts were built. Bill Knudsen has a 50-year relationship with the boatyard. Since 1941, and with the exception of a stint in the Merchant Marine, Knudsen learned and practiced his craft of wooden shipbuilding right here at Peterson's. You know, why did I stay here so long? And, uh, well, I, well, what would you say, the atmosphere, maybe, <laughs> of the place? And, uh, and it was, uh, and, and also the type of work that you do, it's, it's mostly uh, 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 hand, uh, hand work, it's, it's uh, uh, custom work, uh, practically all, all, well, it is all custom work we do here, the repairs now, of, co of course, it's all repairs, but uh, back years ago, it, it was, uh, it was uh, construction, new construction. Peterson's is that type of place. When I first conceived the idea of doing a feature here, I was hoping that the people would match the physical beauty of it. I was not disappointed. John Liscombe is the general manager of the yard. He is the new generation here, and he is continuing the tradition. The place, for some reason, seems to attract interesting people, you know. Our, you, you look at each individual who's here, and you can't quite believe what a character he is. You know, we've got Stanley, we've got, you know, he's an old, old style guy. He's been around a long time. Uh, he's got dry, dry humor. We've got Barry from Ireland. We've got, you know, all kinds of guys, and they're, and they're, they're fun guys. They're fun to work with. And so, you know, the sort of this legacy goes on. It seems like even the UPS driver who ends up showing up here as a character, you know, or the guy who comes to check the gas gauges for the meters ends up being a character. The place attracts characters. And uh, that really is, that really has, that is the continuing thread through the whole thing. Craftsmen still labor here, working on machines in use since near the turn of the century. It's not easy. There's no heat in the shop. And the wooden boats they build are of a smaller variety. All the work is in repair now, like that done on these wooden masts. Everywhere are signs of a bygone era, a time when wood, flesh, and sea were joined as one. Yet there's a feeling one can still get here. You feel it in the shop, 
end in the yard. All one need do is look at the masted ships now in their winter slumber berths and wonder where they've been, what seas they've plowed, what storms they've weathered. Even in their brooding silence, one realizes that there is a dynamic at this place. It feels like, you know, you look at the property, it feels like it hasn't changed in, in a thousand years. But in fact, it changes every year, but gradually. I mean, when I first started here, there were a lot of other buildings uh, that are now gone because the market's changed. But because the people run the thread through the whole thing, the fact that the physical nature of the yard changes uh, doesn't, doesn't make that big a difference. Come here and understand why you may never leave. I'm a boat builder, basically. I, uh, I over the years, got into many other things uh, with, uh, with electricity and, uh, and machine work and uh, painting and, and uh, little blacksmithing and <laughs> one thing and another. So I, I, I think it's the variety of, of work that is here and also, also the variety of people. <laughs> that you meet <laughs> in a place like this. Reporting for Ion Rockland, this is Frank LeBono. <laughs> New York City. It's easy to understand why the world associates our lifestyle with the hustle and bustle of one of its most dynamic cities. It's also easy to forget that this entire area, including the island of Manhattan, once belonged to a culture with a very different lifestyle. Just 30 miles from the supercharged atmosphere of Manhattan lives a tribe of Native Americans trying to preserve a lifestyle and a tradition as old as the mountains that bear their name. The Ramapo Mountain Indians trace their bloodlines to the Aboriginal Muncie tribe that inhabited the North Bergen, Western Rockland areas for thousands of years before the arrival of the first. Here on the grounds of the Mawa Hunt and Polo Club, the Ramapo Indians have staged their third annual powwow. The powwow, an ancient celebration of tradition and culture, was once restricted to Native Americans. Now it is used not only for Native Americans to share their traditions with one another, but for them to expose their culture with non-natives as well. Ronald Van Dunk is also known as Chief Redbone. He is the leader of the 3,000 remaining Ramapo Indians. For him, the rich oral history of the Ramapos was a cornerstone of his early childhood education. Well, most of, most of it is uh, word of mouth. You know, an Indian telling story is word of mouth. It's not written down. And uh, you sit around uh, the dinner table, the, uh, the elders tell you what it used to be like, what you expected of you. We have uh, the younger children that listen and they, and they carry it with them. Uh, we have the medicines that some of the people still use. We have uh, uh, the plants and uh, to make all the herbs and things. So it hasn't been lost. We may, have, we may have lost a bit, but we're going to gain that all back. This is a particularly important year for the Ramapos, and therefore this is an important powwow. Because the majority of the Muncies were forced from this region many centuries ago, those that remained behind mixed with the subsequent races. The Ramapos are a complex mixture of Native American, white, and black lineage. Because of this, the federal government does not officially recognize the Ramapos as a Native American tribe. However, Chief Redbone and the others say that the most important part of their culture is the Native one, and therefore have been fighting for recognition from the federal government since 1978. They have prepared lineage documentation for the past 250 years, and have Native artifacts that date back to 1000 BC. According to Congressman Ben Gilman, who is helping to champion their cause, recognition should and could happen before the end of the year. 
Well, we've been working with the Ramapo tribe for a number of years, uh, trying to help them work through the uh, extensive process that's needed in order to get recognition by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Petition is presently before the Bureau, is nearing completion, and we hope we'll see the culmination of this long, extensive effort. Federal recognition could mean hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Ramapos, money that could be used for schools, housing, and other cultural events that will help to ensure the preservation of their culture. However, the fact that they have to prove their heritage has caused some Ramapos like other people, like European-based people. I mean, the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you know, gets to look at our petition, but it's still a part of the government. Official recognition or not, the Ramapos are determined to continue the practices that have been passed to them for centuries. One of these is the powwow, where they come together with other tribes like the Apache, Lakota, and Cherokee to share, to sing, and to dance. Peter Otter Perry has been given the great honor of lead dancer by Chief Redbone. It's his job to set the pace for each and every dance. Perry rediscovered the power of native dancing while serving as a paratrooper in 1981 at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Since then, it has become a labor of love. Everyone's proud of something. And uh, I, I, uh, I guess I'm showing that through dance. I enjoy it. I love it. And basically, I want everyone to know, uh, non-natives, to understand that this is, a, this is a people, man. Native people are a people, and they have a culture and a way of life. We in the metropolitan area take great pride in our culture and ethnicity. Let's take a moment to acknowledge another one, our native one. So when you hear unusual names like Nyack, Muncie, and Mawa, you'll know where they came from. Reporting for Ion Rockland, I'm Frank Labono. who happen to be the descendants of Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark fame. She married the renowned painter Arthur B. Davies in 1892, and hence, Dr. Davies' farm was born. Since the beloved Dockey, as she was called, did most of the farming between her house calls, and Arthur stayed in his Manhattan studio, the farm is called Dr. Davies, in honor of the woman who cared for both her patients and her land right up until her death at the age of 87. Today the farm is tended by another Davies, Niles M. Jr. Together with his wife of 32 years, Jan, and his family, Niles carries on the tradition started by Dockey over a hundred years ago 
and continued by his father. In the 100 years, Dr. Davies has seen many changes. The original farm is not commercially used any longer. Virtually all of the farming takes place off 304 at the old Nelson farm, which was purchased for granted. The hurricane. Well, <laughs> what? <laughs>